Welcome back to Critical Thinking. This is a series of videos on how to have constructive public debates. Rule 50 from a workbook for arguments says, leave them thinking when you go. This rule basically refers to thinking about the long-term consequences of how you conduct yourself in a public debate. So if you're just focusing on scoring points in the short run, it's less likely to convince people of your position or to get them thinking about it seriously in the long run. So rule 50, we can break down to a series of more practical tips on how to leave them thinking or how to get people to seriously consider your position, even if they might not initially. So the first one is to focus on giving substantive reasons or evidence for your positions and not just passionate rhetoric. Rhetoric here refers to the art of public speaking, but it can also mean just uh, uses of language that do not count as justification, logically speaking, for a conclusion, but rather are attempts to persuade the audience through emotion and um, undertone, like emotional undertone or overtone. So the idea here is pretty obvious on the one hand, like most people could understand this distinction would say, yes, yes, of course, give reasons, not just rhetoric. But in practice, this rule or this principle is seldom followed in public debates. So if you look at internet debates on Twitter, social, other social media websites, YouTube comment sections, they almost only involve passionate rhetoric, name calling, ad hominem attacks, loaded language. That's almost all it is. So if you think more systematically about this idea of giving substantive reasons, it could transform the style, the manner in which you engage in public debates. It's not something that you can perhaps instantly change, but become aware of what you're actually saying and doing and its long-term effects and consider focusing not on leveling personal attacks, throwing shade on the other side, but rather giving substantive reasons for your position. A second way to leave them thinking when you go is to seek to change people's beliefs at the margin versus a wholesale conversion. If you can make points that the other side could reasonably agree with and see, you're more likely to have a lasting impact than just trying to convert them straight away. So be willing to think of the long term, play a long game, and just change people's beliefs at the margin. That is, things that they might agree with, but that will not change their whole position right away. An example of this could be in a debate about religion. So even if you're, suppose that you don't believe that God exists and you're critical of someone else's religious beliefs and vice versa, your strategy may not be to try to persuade them that God does not exist. But for instance, if all the evidence they're appealing to comes from a sacred scripture, you might be trying to convince them of something very modest that, for example, not every single proposition in the scripture is true. There might be some that are not true or that just aren't even propositions or that could be interpreted differently. Uh, you may try to point out some contradictions in the text, etc. Now, religious debates are notoriously difficult because people on both sides tend to be very committed emotionally to their position. Religion is often a big part of people's identity, etc but it's much more likely to leave an impact if you focus on more modest claims at the margin than trying to go straight away to get people to completely renounce their belief or position. A third way of following Rule 50 is to model civil behavior and rational argumentation. So this really shows the intersection between critical thinking and your personality, your mindset, your character as a human being. If you're emotionally immature, if you don't have emotional fitness or even spiritual fitness, you're not going to be able to do this. You're going to be controlled by your emotions. You're going to be seeking to attack your opponent or their position to insult them, to just tear them down by any means necessary. You're not going to be modeling civil behavior. You have to, in order to get people to consider your position carefully, 
you have to transform your character or at least improve it to the point where you're not just being overly um, emotional in your criticisms, not being unreasonable, not being vicious, not being mean spirited, not being uncharitable, etc. Number four, be open to learning new information and changing your mind. So part of the point of being civil is just to get people to take your own views more seriously. But another thing to keep in mind is intellectual humility, that you don't know everything. Some of what you believe now is false, no matter how smart you are. That's just the way things are. Human beings have limited information and limited rationality. So right now, as you are, you have false beliefs and you have some biases. So in order to, if you, what you care about is the truth and not just looking right, looking like you won in a particular debate or interchange, you should be open to learning new information and changing your mind. So this is something also that involves character and humility, um, as well as just a love of the truth and wanting to get things right caring more about the truth than your ego, and you will benefit yourself in the long run. Number five, pose thought-provoking questions. So this is something suggested by the textbook, A Workbook for Arguments. Um, the idea is even if you choose to exit a debate because it's getting too unproductive or hot, you might be able to make a contribution nonetheless by posing thought-provoking questions before you leave. By posing them as questions, as opposed to giving answers, you can make a contribution to people's thinking, even if they disagree with you strongly and you don't know how else to get to them. Another way of, another use for thought-provoking questions though, is in, uh, if you're following the double crux method from a previous video, where you're trying to get to the crucial part of a disagreement, sometimes thought-provoking questions can be a way of generating those more fundamental principles about which you disagree and if about which if you change your mind, then you would also change your mind about the proposition that's currently being debated. So that's another function of the thought provoking question. Let's look at a sample problem where we're being asked to pose thought provoking questions. So this um, idea is something you could apply to a variety of topics. And the idea is the posing of thought provoking questions is going to be most useful in topics that are highly inflammatory, controversial. Now, right now, as of recording this, this is May 20th, 2020. We're still in the grips of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. So I'm sure this example is not going to age well. It's gonna be um, a kind of relic of history pretty soon. But the point is, it's currently a very contentious topic. And I see the debate about not only the nature of the pandemic, the nature of the virus and the disease it causes, what the policy solution should be. It's not only contentious, I would say pretty toxic on both sides. Um, it's very partisan and political. People cannot even agree on the facts very easily because they have attached um, their views about the virus and about what should be done to their political identities. So it's very difficult to make headway. And so an initial way of trying to make headway into this debate may be just to pose questions that each side might be able to investigate more thoroughly and perhaps they haven't thought about very carefully before they formed their positions. So here's some examples. How does the fatality rate of SARS-CoV-2 compare to that of past pandemics? Now, indeed, many people have thought about this question already, and they've proposed um, widely different answers to it. But it's good, you can still start with a question like this and then dig a little deeper into the question itself. So what methods are used to measure fatality rates? One thing that's been brought up is that, um, even though this is no longer true, it previously was that on some measures uh, earlier in the year, the um, annual deaths from influenza were greater than the current deaths from SARS-CoV-2 in many nations. Um, even though I believe that's no longer true, it's also maybe a misleading comparison because of the different ways in which um, the flu 
um, fatality rate and the SARS-CoV-2 fatality rate are calculated. Actually, in this case, I'm not talking about fatality rate per se, which is like, for instance, the number of people per million in the population who die from the virus, but rather the total number of deaths in a given country. That's often the way people are framing this debate. Um, because the way that the deaths from the flu is calculated is an estimate. It's not based on confirmed deaths. It's based on estimates using confirmed deaths from the flu, but also other um, information like demographics. Um, whereas if you look at the deaths count from SARS-CoV-2, that is based on confirmed cases. So it's going to be um, lower than the actual number of deaths caused by SARS-CoV-2. And it's going to be comparing apples to oranges with the flu fatality rate if you're using not confirmed cases of flu deaths, but estimated cases of flu deaths as a point of comparison. So the idea is, in order to answer this question, uh, we're going to have to dig deeper and think more carefully about how we even measure or estimate the fatality rate. So one thing that's been done with SARS-CoV-2 is to try to use random or semi-random sampling of populations to see how many people are actually infected with the virus and compare that to the confirmed death rate. Um, and this can be better than using the confirmed SARS-CoV-2 cases versus confirmed deaths because the number of confirmed cases is likely to be um, much lower than the number of actual cases, even a bigger discrepancy than the number of confirmed deaths to actual deaths. Another question, is there a correlation between the fatality rates in different nations and their policies for responding to the pandemic. In other words, there's a lot of debate, a lot of fiery rhetoric that's being thrown around about the relative efficacy of different nations' policies. And some nations are you know, declaring victory or saying, see, this other country didn't do a good job, um, and we did based on the current numbers. Um, However, it's interesting to look at the actual fatality rates by nation and comparing that to the policies. Do countries that have more restrictive policies like lockdowns, shelter in place orders, um, how much does that correlate with the fatality rates in those, in those nations? Now, they're going to be confirming factors because the fatality rate in a given nation is not only going to be influenced by government policy, but um, they're also going to be influenced by other factors. But still, that's going to be a useful piece of information. Um, another kind of semi-related question is looking at people's behaviors and to see if they correlate to the nation's policies. I recently saw some data from uh, cell phones or mobile data that showed that in most countries or all the countries for which um, the data was presented, people did not actually noticeably stay at home more after stay at home orders. So this is very perplexing. It's very counterintuitive, but um, it's the type of thing you want to ask and look into. And there could be various possible reasons for this. It's possible that even before nations adopted stay at home orders, people were voluntarily isolating more because of their knowledge that it could be dangerous to go out and expose themselves to the virus. Um, it could also be that despite the stay at home order, a lot of people have been violating it regularly, you know, to go grocery shopping, etc. And they can actually track this through anonymous cell phone data. Another question is how much of the variation in the fatality rate of each nation is explained by demographic factors, such as the average age of the population. And you could use this in conjunction with the previous question, compare how much of the variation in fatality rates correlates with national policy, how much of the variation correlates with demographic factors. Now, the correlation does not prove causation in either case, but the point is, if you think that national policy is the main driver in reducing or raising pol uh, fatality rates, that could be objectively incorrect just based on the strength of the correlation. So you could disprove the idea that one factor is bigger at explaining the correlation just by testing how it compares to other factors. And indeed, I'm not sure all the data is out there yet. I mean, the, the fatality rates are still going to be changed um, as the virus progresses. But the point is, um, some nations are going to have higher fatality rates just because their populations are older on average. For example, Europe um, has an older population than um, Latin America or Africa 
or India. And so just based on the fact that older people are more likely to die from SARS-CoV-2, if the population in your country is older than that of another nation, then you're going to have a higher fatality rate regardless of what the national policy is in order to the policy to respond to the, the virus. Another question, what is the economic cost of shutdown or stay at home orders? So this is something that even if, if two sides disagree about whether the shutdown is desirable or how long the shutdown should go on or how extensive it should be, blah, 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 they should be able to both be incentivized to try to measure this. What is the economic cost of a shutdown? And you can use that information. It's not the sole way of evaluating the effectiveness of a shutdown, but for evaluating the effectiveness of any policy, you want to try to estimate both its benefits and its costs and see if it is superior to other alternative policies on a cost benefit analysis. Another question, what is the number of lives saved by the shutdown or stay at home orders? And so the previous question about is one way of estimating the costs of shutdown, there could be other costs too, besides economic. And then this question is about the benefits and there could be other benefits too, apart from saving lives. And so, but these are first approaches to trying to do a cost benefit analysis of a given shutdown or stay at home order. Another question, are there more efficient ways of saving lives than shutdown or stay at home orders? So this one's a bit tricky, but because the economic impact, the economic cost of most of the shutdown orders are very large, the details depend both on the individual economies and the details of the orders, but the economic cost tends to be quite high. Could we get more bang for our buck, as it were, by allowing some economic activity, maybe taxing that economic activity and using the taxes to fund things? Like maybe we could allow more economic activity, tax it 1% higher, and then use that to uh, pay for vaccine research or acquiring more personal protective equipment for healthcare workers, etc. These are just ideas. I'm not suggesting them as actual policies, but the point is, in order to evaluate a policy like shutdown or stay at home, you have to evaluate its cost and benefits and then compare it to alternatives in terms of what could be other ways of generating the same benefit at a lower cost. And finally, how much is spent to save lives in other contexts, such as vaccination campaigns, transportation infrastructure, and wars against terrorist organizations? I'm getting this question um, I got this idea from a blog post on Slate Star Codex by Scott Alexander, who had a link recently about the coronavirus, and he raised a lot of thought-provoking questions like this. Um, so you'll notice if you actually look at how much money people are willing to spend to save lives in other contexts, it varies a lot. So one way of saving a large number of lives for a relatively small cost is donating to vaccination campaigns. Um, other examples in which people trade off um, lives for economic cost is in the design of transportation infrastructure. So for example, if we allow certain speeds on highways, we know we're going to increase the fatality rate, or at least hypothetically, we might have a trade-off between speed limits and fatality rates. It's actually been disputed, but for the sake of the example, just suppose that's true. However, we do not set the speed limit so low that we would minimize fatality rates because those would have huge economic costs. If the speed limit were 10 miles per hour, then it would reduce fatality rates from um, automobile accidents, but it would increase the cost of shipping and transportation so much that it would not be worth it. So we make these calculations in other contexts of how much we're willing to spend economically to save a life or prevent a death. And then another context is the amount spent on wars, for example, by the United States against terrorist organizations. Here, there tends to be a large amount of money spent for a small payoff. Um, and sometimes it can be difficult to determine if there actually is any benefit in terms of reduced terrorist attacks. It just depends on the example. But the point is people tend to be very inconsistent in how much they're willing to spend to save a life across these various contexts. And it's not because they have some deeper theory typically that would justify the differences in different contexts. It's because they're driven by different emotions in different contexts. And so they're not making rational comparisons between the cost benefit analysis of these different policies. 
So this is an example of how you can drill deeper into an issue and try to get to more fundamental questions that could potentially resolve disputes or if you feel you have to step out of a dispute, at least leave both sides thinking and clarifying what they believe and why.